to make this introduction as we begin our awards. So, Dr. Mandina Thomas is a founder, former treasurer, and past president of BTN. She authored BTN's 501c3 award and instituted many things for BTN. She even wrote a song about her love for BTN from the melody of It's In My Heart BTN, It's In My Hand. Yeah. You have to let her sing a little bit of it, it's great. <laughs> she has taught at East High School, her alma mater in Youngstown, Ohio. She has also taught at the University of Michigan, Spelman College, Bowman Green State University, and the University of Louisville, where she helped develop the theater department with the theater department, an undergraduate minor in black theater. Yeah. And they are the only university to do so. Mm -hmm. Woo! Every undergraduate student has to take three black theater classes to graduate, and master students have to take two. She is retired now from academia and directs for the New Horizon Theater in Pittsburgh and for Youngstown, Ohio. Ohio, may I please get a round of applause for Dina, Lundina, Dr. Lundina Thomas. introduction, I do have to make one correction. Um, we are not the only university to have an undergraduate minor. What we do have is a graduate certificate in African American Theater, and we are the only university who does that at this time. But I'm expecting others to follow. Okay, maybe one of you will be the one who goes to your university and have a graduate certificate leading onward to a master's in African American theater. We don't have one yet, and we need one. So this is a, a something for you to work towards the future. I am so excited to have this opportunity to work with the young scholars. It is a wonderful. Um, when I started out in BT and I was a graduate student, and my um, fellow person that I hung out with was Adele Austin Anderson. And uh, she's married to Gary Anderson. But um, while she was still an undergraduate, we used to hook up and go to the conferences together. And it was so much fun. And this is the Young Scholars Competition. And that was Adele's baby. Uh, she worked really hard. She brought it to uh, the board. Uh, the board was excited about it, and we had our first uh, uh, young scholar in 1988. And that young lady is now has her PhD and is teaching at a college university. So we were very happy to have that. And we first started it with just undergraduate, and then we uh, went on to graduate students. And we first started it just giving $250 to first place and $100 for second place. And now we're up to 500 for first place and 250 for second place. And I mean, you know, by next year, or the next two years, we don't know. <laughs> you know, but we're gonna be pushing to make it higher and higher because we want to encourage you. It's not easy when you choose academia. Uh, there's a lot of adversity against you. Even though everybody tells you, oh, that's so wonderful, you know, you're getting more than one degree, that's very <laughs> necessary. People are like, when are you going to get a job? <laughs> um, my aunt told me when I got my master's degree, she said, oh, that's an invitation to your wedding. I said, no, oh, I'm getting a master's degree. She said, oh, I thought you were getting me. What is a master's degree? What is a master's degree? But she did come to when I graduated and got my degree. So it's wonderful and it's remarkable. And so I'm not going to continue talking on because you want to hear the young scholars. You want to hear what they have to say. And I want you to know um, the information, because I read all the papers, and the information is new. This is not something you have read before. This is new. We're going to start with our first student, um, Unina. Unina 
Barbara Penny from the University of Texas at Austin. <laughs> We're going to continue to come in each time. We're going to go forward and we're going to uh, have the second place graduate winner, um, Kwanda Johnson from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. Um, again, my name is Janina Barker Payne, and I just have to say I have been so full over the past few days, so I just want to honor and say thank you to Black Theater Network for making this opportunity available um, to come into the fold as a new scholar. Um, it has been a blessing and a gift to just be in the room, so thank you. I um, also have to acknowledge my ensemble family here in the room. That is how I learned about Black Theater Network. So to come into this fold new and then to see family and to be welcomed as family has not been lost on me, especially at the University of Texas at Austin, which does not look like this at every hand. <laughs> so if it's okay today, I just want to start with some storytelling. If that's all right, if that's all right, y'all can tell me that's all right. That's all right. All right. All right. So this story begins with a t-shirt. And thank you to Mr. Brown for your support. Uh, so, in 2019, as a first year graduate student in the Department of Theater and Dance at the University of Texas at Austin, I had an opportunity to present at the African Americans in North Carolina, excuse me, there we go, at the African Americans in Western North Carolina and Southern Appalachia Conference. It was the first time that I had been invited to be on a panel as an Afro-Latian theater maker. Um, and I was on the panel alongside some of the most revered scholars in the field of Black and Appalachian studies. Um, some of those folks included filmmakers, historians, another Afro-Latian artist who was a visual artist, and the renowned, most prominent scholar in Black Appalachian studies, Dr. William Turner. During this panel, um, as the last person on the presentation, uh, Dr. Turner gave a boisterous speech on a podium very similar to this uh, that basically said, Afrolatcha is not all it's cracked to be. He said that Afrolatcha uh, was just limited to a, a nice, cute brand on a t shirt. <laughs> that Afrolatcha was nothing but a brand. And I will tell y'all, I'm from Kentucky. You probably heard the accent in my voice. Um, I was raised right. My mama taught me how to be in a room, how to show some respect, all of my elders. And yet, I found red rush to my face. And I saw my eyebrows, I felt them start to furl. And my fists started to shake a little bit because I wondered, what about all the ways Afrolatcha is more than just a cute t-shirt? <laughs> So this paper is born out of that moment and that t-shirt. Um, from then on, um, as I thought about the ways in which Afrolatra, which is a term that was coined by Frank X. Walker, a poet laureate, um, he described it to mean and to represent black people in and of the region of Appalachia. And at first it started out in the literary space, but what he did was even in the 90s gave me an invitation as a young artist to be able to embrace that concept as someone with roots from the region. And so just a few panels earlier, I had performed a piece in the style of Appalachian theater making and made a argument for the ways in which Appalachian can be used as a praxis and as a dramaturgical practice in order to understand, especially for folks interested in telling stories about the region, how I we approach it so in a way that people when they hear Appalachia, they don't just think the image that maybe some of you are thinking right now. <laughs> <laughs> So from that, um, I've been engaged in a performance project entitled The Afrolatian Memory Plays and had the gift and the honor of being able to present some of that work at the Ensemble Theater in Houston, Texas. This is actually, um, as an emerging scholar, one of those performances. And what I've learned is, even outside of the region, there's a way to talk about being from Appalachia, there's a way to put those stories on stage and engage in a collaborative world-making process that allows even outsiders to the region to understand what are the nuances of place, of race, and of gender. 
Now fast forward, I was sad to leave my Houston home. I knew I had and I had to honor my own fair years. Um, that this, this first show was The Legend of Mountain Mama and it gets at environmental activism and that's not where my story ends because when I got to the University of Texas at Austin, I switched to a very specific focus on black women artists in Appalachia. And the piece I'm going to tell you about today is inspired by the work of Afro-Latin poet and writer Crystal Wilkinson. Crystal Wilkinson is considered uh, the Kentucky Poet Laureate right now. Um, she also has a collection of short stories, some um, multiple novels, one of which, her first, is Blackberries, Blackberries. Blackberries, Blackberries is a short story novel about a book of growing up in Kentucky from the 1960s to the 1980s. They are simple, small vignettes of what life might look like, feel like, live like as a Kentucky person in what's considered the Appalachian region. When I first came across this novel, I actually have a cousin who was the first assistant doctor in my family. She produced this work at Eastern Kentucky University and did a stage adaptation of seven of the 21 stories in this novel. As a new graduate student and someone always aware of who I carry in the room with me, one of the things I was wondering about is, what about the other stories? Seven out of 21, if some of you are you're good with that, you know, that's only a third. And so, and as a graduate student, one of the things that I endeavored to do was to take those stories and to translate some of the ones that resonate with me in this day and age, as a millennial, on the stage. One of the qualities that most stuck out to me in how I decided which stories to tell was the color purple. Being from Kentucky, I know that we have the gift of sometimes the Kentucky sky. This is the image of the Kirkland Gap where I spent bloody summers going to 4-H camp, learning all the things about how to be country and urban at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> the, the color purple, as we know, is nothing new to black culture, to theater making, and in fact, when I think about and consider why is the color purple important to me as a theater maker, I think about everybody who has that one cousin that can recite every line of the color purple. And even yesterday, I said, I the, come on, cuz. I met a new family member, and as I departed, we both did that thing that all of us know, right? So the color purple is a gift to me, not simply because of the reference for our culture and theater making, but also because of, as a black feminist theater maker, one of the ways that I understand the theory of black feminism is through Alice Walker, who makes a distinguish, distinction in purple and lavender as she talks about the difference between womanism and black feminism and, and black women's opportunities to be the center of focus. She says that purple is to lavender as womanism is to feminism. And so with that gift and that thought through line, um, I endeavored to adapt those new stories, the stories that where the color purple stuck out to me in this short story novel and consider what might the idea of the color purple look like in the adaptation of Black Bears, Black Bears. And I just have to point out, for those of you who are, who I know we're all into aesthetics, but especially visual aesthetics of the covers, even as I look at the framing for what is staged here, even in the covers alone, I found some similarities between what, how we feel about these pictures. And I think that this similarity visually is also something that translates to the work that we did together on stage. Now, I have to preface by saying I am not a costume designer by training. I have been trained in directing and acting. And as a playwright, I have been supported. And that, and that was very much through the ensemble theater. I have to acknowledge that. But what I do know is that it's seldom that we get an opportunity to see into a director's vision outside of the outside product. I was grateful for the presentation yesterday. We were talking about process. And so if it's OK, I'm going to follow Dr. Young's lead and talk a little bit about process today. All right? Um, so this production of Black Berries, which is a title for Black Berries, Please, was produced this past spring in the Cohen New Works Festival. That is one of the major festivals that the University of Texas at Austin hosts. It is all student-led and run, um, and it is a series of new works in different forms. So some of them might be film, dance, theater. More Black Berries, Please, 
was presented in April of this semester. And what we have is a combination of student performers and one performer who actually is a performer I've met out in the Austin community gathering to tell these stories. Again, these are small tidbits, so snippets of each of the stories. So together we worked to tell seven, nine stories about black women growing up. Now again, I mentioned that the color purple is one of those key quality and elements that stuck out to me. So when I consider how does the color purple show up in these stories, it shows up in Racine, Josephine, Aberdeen, and Naoma. In each of their short stories, the quality of purple gives us information about not only who these young people were and young women were in their communities, but also what lessons we can learn from them in our own communities. I'll begin with Naoma. <coughs> Naoma is a girl that is 16 years old in the short story, Secret Keepers. She is someone who is considered to be a child that should be seen and not heard. She's someone that gets the brunt of her mother's anger and rage. She carries the anguish of some past trauma that we don't really get a chance to see, but we can imagine has been her mother's experience. And she's not necessarily the apple of her eye. The good thing is that Naoma has a secret keeper in Clifton. Clinton also is alienated in the story. He has a different cognitive ability that lets us know as readers that he's treated differently because he's a little different. Um, in the story, it says that people consider him, and I quote, ignorant and therefore dumb. And both of them are referenced in the same way that we understand Maya Angelou as having a period in their young life where they went mute. Now, despite knowing this quality in the pages of the book, as a playwright and advisor, the gift that Crystal Wilkinson gave me was an opportunity to dream about the qualities of the conversations between these two young people. Within those conversations, I understand the color purple to come up in Naoma's scarf. You see, every time Naoma and Clifton come together in the backwoods of Kentucky, that purple scarf is mentioned. Sometimes it's in Clifton's back pocket, Sometimes it's holding some cornbread that is a gift, a secret gift when they meet. Other times it's an item that they're looking for. So this purple scarf, I come to understand not just as a representation of a gift from one young person to another, but as a symbol of personhood, as a symbol of resistance. Every time they meet secretly, that purple scarf is there as another character in their relationship of two young people that are ignored everywhere else, but when they come together. The purple scarf is first. The next time we see purple is on dresses. There are a number of stories in which black women are donned in purple dresses as a way for us to understand some key moments in their lives. In the case of the purple dress, I'll start first with some less sophisticated dresses. That's an Aberdeen. Aberdeen is a young woman who is with the child when we meet her. Her story, coming back yesterday, is her testament, her bearing witness to having been a person that endured abuse in her home growing up as a girl. As she's in this future-oriented warm moment, thinking about carrying the life of the child in her womb, she's also, at the same time, haunted by her past. Aberdeen is in the process of trying to reconcile what does it mean to hold this new young life, knowing that the young life that she held and was, that it wasn't held and protected in the same way. When she hums her song and sings her truth in Humming Back Yesterday, she imagines a little girl in a purple dress with flowers. As she sings her truth to her future baby, she also sings to the past child that she was. Also bearing witness for the first time and what we can imagine is the family dynamic where she was never allowed to say what happened to her. Purple then becomes the image of advocacy. I understand purple as the way in which she's able to give and shed light on the things that happen to young girls in their homes that people don't ever talk about, but that everybody knows. 
Not only is purple a representation of her past, her little girl self, it's also flipped to an opportunity for the future. We know that she's carrying a young girl inside of her right now, and our hope is that in her song, she's able to break the silence. Purple dresses. Now, all the dresses in this storybook are not house robes or little girls, but there's also another type of dress that comes up that I think is actually my favorite. It's the purple wedding gown. <laughs> Crystal Wilkinson gives me the gift as a director and as a reader, the image of black women getting married in lavender. I see this in Josephine Childs. Now Josephine Childs in the story Tipping the Scales, she's what we might call a round away girl. I like to think of her as a woman empowered to have as many sexual partners as she wants whenever she wants in the name of Afrofuturism breaking out of stereotypes, right? But some people might read her as a little loosey-goosey. Um, let's just say every time she gets a new partner, she gets a new baby. And uh, part of the image of tipping the scales is the image of the community members literally tipping into her business. <laughs> so in this case, Josephine's child's story is one that we have to, that I'm understanding as a woman that has been a product like Aberdeen of some circumstances where the adults in her life failed her. That she, at some point she was a young person that like Naoma was not acknowledged and allowed for her voice to be heard. And that she's reconciling that in real time in her community as a woman trying to find and make love. And she's making decisions, but unfortunately those decisions allow her to be in a cycle of sometimes abuse and at other times a cycle where she is actually relegated to poverty. Every time she has another mouth to feed, she has to find another way to feed those mouths. So the good news is, Crystal Wilkinson doesn't leave us there. She gives us an image of an ad, a Josephine who has an ability to move past what society says are her limits. She finds a man who's actually good for her and stays around long enough to see those children and raise them, and she's married in a purple dress. So with all of this said, I just want to acknowledge that Born Black Mary's Peace um, was an opportunity to work with students in collaboration and to think about, again, what is Appalachian theater making? That is, black stories centered in the region. How, how is it more than just a cute t-shirt? Thank you so much. Triptych consisting of a theatrical event concert performed at the Play Circle Theater of 2022 on the University of Wisconsin Madison campus. An art installation exhibited at the Chazen Museum of Art, also on the University of Wisconsin Madison campus in 2022, and a dissertation essay. Trauspiel is German for tragedy and hearkens to the Germanic ideal of white supremacy and a master race. 
subject into non-being? Is the erasure, or more accurately, the liminality of the African in the Atlantic world? Through qualitative inquiry, I argue that there is a beingness, a creative ontology for the black body psyche beyond victim, and that the betweenness of black trauma, that liminal space I call scramble, is a melange of adaptability, innovation, and disruption, where the ontology of blackness in Atlantic modernity may reside. The scramble of black being in the Americas positions the black body psyche as the arbiter of newness in the so-called new world. Part autoethnography, part practice as research, Trauschfield's subject into non-being analyzes my own creative practice as I examine personal catalytic events that compel me to craft theater, poetic literature, and visual art that validate black being. This self-examination looks at three manifestations of violence against the black body psyche. The ridicule of the sub-Saharan African phenotype, predations of the mob vigilante, and what I call hegemonically instigated violence that creeps or seeps into the safe black space. And here I focus primarily on the home. My three primary theorist practitioners are visual artist Romare Bearden, director choreographer Bill T. Jones, and cultural theorist performance artist Coco Fusco. And here I'm leaning into the interdisciplinary uh, uh, part or construct of my dissertation. Each of these theorist practitioners are supported by a cast of theorists and playwrights operating in historiography, sociology, philosophy, autobiography, and theatrical literature. My dissertation is divided into three segments. Segment one, in search of Negro land, a different study of the Negro race. It explores the white gaze and the violence of ridicule. Through Romare Bearden's collage methodology of fracture, layering, and risk, what I call breaking to build, along with his jazz blues aesthetic of improvisation and call and response, I look anew at myself at 12 on the fringe as the nappy-headed, big-nosed, big-lipped, red-boned, ugly little black girl. A disturbing picture and photo negative for my family and peers indoctrinated into a phenotypical self-loathing. Theatrically, I find my way back to my 12-year-old self and provide her with validation. Here you see dancers engaged in the Adawa. Okay, you don't see it. <laughs> it's not on the, on the projection screen. But uh, in In Search of Negro Land, a different study of the Negro race, I conflate forms of performance in dialogue with one another. I have three women who are dancing in a very specific West African vernacular. It is the Adawa dance form of the Akan of Ghana. And that is conflated with a drummer who is drumming in the Afro-Atlantic vernacular, salsa, samba, rumba, bomba. And then I, as the poet, am taking language and I'm fracturing it, I'm tearing it, I'm layering it and piecing it together. And that is mirrored in the projections that are being presented to the audience. So that the audience, they become thought workers, or what Boal calls spect actors. They're not just spectators. So layered over these sounds is this idea of the black phenotype through the white gaze. Our lips, the fullness of our lips, the spread of our nostrils or our noses, the texture or kink or nap of our hair, the 
fullness and voluptuousness of our posteriors. All of these are coming at the audience through the media. The plays and dialogue with In Search of Negroland, for which I offer critical analysis in my dissertation, are Adrian Kennedy's Funny House of a Negro, 1962, Susan Laurie Park's Venus, 1990, and Lydia Diamond's Voyeur de Venus, 2006. The Avatar is an artwork for all of these pieces. And that mirror in our installation to In Search of Negro Land, a different study of the Negro race, is In Search of Negro Land, Beauty Suspended. And in that hanging mobile, I take these hegemonic indicators of blackness and I place them through collage in a utopian setting. Segment two. The Ballad of Anthony Crawford, A Love Letter to America, examines the violence of the mob vigilante through artistry of Bill T. Jones and his scramble of irregular choreographic juxtapositions and interdisciplinary elements that speak to his own autobiography. So there's this precedence in autoethnography uh, through Bill T. Jones's work. My paternal grandfather's cousin, Anthony Crawford, was one of the wealthiest men in Abbeville County, South Carolina, black or white. He was lynched on October 21st, 1916 for the crime of impudence. His last coherent words were, I thought I was a good citizen. His lynching robbed our family of generational wealth, thrusting us into the great migration, and a vast dispersal. Here in the Ballad of Anthony Crawford, again, uh, I'm going to describe for you the image that you would have seen, is the artistic engagement of dance forms and positionality. Bill T. Jones is very famous for scrambling elements, melange of elements that on the surface or at first glance seem to have nothing to do with each other but are in conversation. And I replicate that with the Ballad of Anthony Crawford. White bodies playing djembe. White bodies tap dancing. The lone black body jockeys for position while using her dancing body to paint in red, white, blue, and black on an onstage canvas with her feet, her elbows, her knees, the sensations from the projected media lynchings, every conceivable kind of lynching is projected. And all of this stew of sensation also involves visual art. Because there is a person on stage drawing in real time neither black nor white who is figuring out what does this thing America mean. And on the opposite side of the stage is a blank canvas. And the audience is involved uh, or are invited to get up out of their seats, insert themselves into the theatrical space, and make their mark. The plays that are in dialogue with the ballad of Anthony Crawford, are Georgia Douglas Johnson's A Sunday Morning in the South, 1925, both the black and white church versions, and Charles Smith's The Gospel According to James, 2011, chronicling the lynching of 16-year-old James Cameron in 1930 in Marion, Indiana, which he lives to give witness. The artwork, the avatar, is the Ballad of Anthony Crawford remix. It is a series of Crawford portraits layered with scrambled words and images. Finally, segment three, which is the titular Trauspiel subject into non-ellipse being, 
and then parenthesized the sum of it all. Here I'm studying the hegemonically instigated violence as played out in my nuclear and extended family with its umbilical connection to the lynching of Anthony Crawford. This segment sets me up as a reverse ethnographer, an agonist in the mode of Coco Fusco, as I trouble my audience by airing the taboo, violence within safe black spaces, and trace that crack to the source which is hegemonic instigation and infiltration. I got some pushback as an aside from some of my colleagues at uh, UW uh, Madison. As you know, there are very few who look like me on campus, who look like us. And so there is a, a defensiveness that is expected and understood when black folks start talking about black issues particularly private and personal black issues. Why are you giving the oppressor fodder for the fire? And I remember quoting to them Audre Lorde's very famous, very oft quoted, your silence will not protect you. <laughs> Our silence about what happens in the safe black space will not protect us. So the plays that explore this part that I'm interrogating um, with this work, Trial Shreel Subject and Not Being, are Dale Orlander Smith's Monster, 1996, Pearl Clegg's Chain, 1992, and Lydia Diamond's The Bluest Eye, 2007. My final art installation shares the dissertation title, Trial Schmiel Subject into Non-Being, and is a composite of found objects and family pictures. Hmm. Uh, I had the final uh, quote, and I'm going to have to try to conjure it up from memory, but uh, this is the last. Each of my pieces are centered around a long-form uh, poem that I've written. And for this last one, Trauschfeld, I say, for the non-entity, for the non-being, a oh, legacy of pain. Confirm that I am alive. Thank you. And now we're going to have our undergraduate First prize went to Dia Armstrong from California State University, San Bernardino. <laughs> <laughs> and the second prize went to uh, Ogotobi, um, and I'm learning how to pronounce her last name. Um, it's so beautiful. The ever-present narrative of comparable analysis of Sally's race, and you know who wrote Sally's race, right? Some of us do. Okay. Uh -oh. Robin McCauley, remember her? Yeah. And Confederates by Dominique Marisol, a new play that was on Broadway. Okay? And after, uh, uh, so now we will have uh, Dia who's going to talk about the importance of William Wells Brown. senior at California State University, studying theater arts with an emphasis in technical and design. Last year, I was required to come up with a question regarding one of my topics in my African American Literature of Identity course, which covered black theater, its history, and its impact. This essay and presentation, first person accounts, and the importance of William Wells Brown's work, is an extended version of that original question which focuses on the memoirs, works, and life of the abolitionist and first African-American playwright of the 1800s, William Wells Brown. My original question was, 
How was William Wells Brown's life impacted by being born a mixed slave? Not a bad question to start out with. But like all things, it evolved with my research because the more I read about Brown's life, this one question became this statement. Though written two centuries ago, Brown's themes are still important and relevant in today's world due to the abundance of anti-blackness, racism, and colorism rampant in the United States of America today. Brown's work provides an excellent example of the importance of reading about first-person accounts and the experiences faced by oppressed peoples in order to understand the significance of these hardships. For this presentation, I will discuss the, the points and connections between Brown's life, his works and themes, the humanizing effect that his, world, his works had, how that comes and impacts other black playwrights, and the purpose of black theater. Understanding the historical context behind Brown's work, the slavery of imprisoned Africans in colonial America, includes understanding his life and upbringing, which played a key inspiration in Brown's works. Now, who is William Wells Brown? Brown is an abolitionist and the first African American man to publish a play in 1858. He was born a slave in 1814. His mother, Elizabeth, was sexually assaulted by George Higgins, a relative of their slave owner. He was repeatedly hired out as a slave in Lexington, Kentucky, in St. Louis, Missouri, where he, before he was 20 years old, he attempted to escape three times and was successful on his third attempt. According to Slavery at Hope Point by Brenna Pay, by the mid-1800s, 30% of Lexington's population was African American. Lexington's economic growth was mainly constructed by the influx of slave labor on farms, compared to St. Louis, which focused on urban slave labor in shipyards and construction. Brown wrote in his memoir, though slavery is thought by some to be mild in Missouri, when compared with the cotton, sugar, and rice growing states, Yet no part of our slaveholding country is more noted for the barbarity of its inhabitants than St. Louis. It was here that Colonel Harney, a United States officer, whipped a slave woman to death. It was here that Francis, Francis McIntosh, a free colored man from Pittsburgh, was taken from the steamboat Flora and burned at the stake. St. Louis contained over two dozen of auction houses, including the most predominant trader Bernard Lynch's slave pen. Before it was destroyed in 1963, it was only two minutes away from where we hold this conference today. Wow. Brown was assisted across the Mississippi River to Ohio by a Quaker family on his third attempt to escape, from which he received his last name, Wells Brown. He continued to speak out against slavery, but amidst the passage of the Fugitive Slave Act in 18, 1850, he lectured against the enslavement of African Americans in Europe. The first person accounts found in his memoirs help provide a direct link to Brown's inspiration and indicate that his creative works provides the reader with accurate accounts of the cruelty endured by black men under the condition of enslavement. He wrote about his experiences in memoirs and plays, narrative of William W. Brown, a fugitive slave, and three years in Europe, or places I have seen and people I have met, were used as the primary source for this essay as they most accurately de detailed his life and work. His well-known novel, Clotel, tells the story of Thomas Jefferson and his fictional slave daughters and the tragic life of biracial Americans in the 1800s. Experience had to give a how to Give a Northerner Backbone, which tells the story of a white cleric who was mistakenly sold into slavery, was written as a reputation to Nehemiah Adams, a South Side view of slavery, which credited slavery as beneficial to the religious character of black slaves. Mm -hmm. Brown ridiculed Adams and stated that since he had spent 20 years a slave, he knew as much about the peculiar institution. He read experience in place of a lecture in November 1857. His reasoning behind this being, quote, 
people will pay to hear the drama that would not give assent in an anti-slavery lecture. <laughs> this quote leads us into the third idea regarding Brown's work and how it impacted colonial America. The use of first-person accounts within his memoirs and letters served to spread word of the injustices against black Americans, but reading the first-person accounts of historical injustices helps to sympathize with and humanize those oppressed people. Brown's work had a multitude of thematic elements that resonated with African Americans, such as racism, a free life versus an enslaved life, and escape. To explain the correlation between themes, life, and Brown's work, I'll look at Brown's first published play, The Escape or A Leap for Freedom. The Escape was published in 1858 and first produced in 1871. It is a play about the secret marriage of Glenn, an enslaved African American man, and Melinda, an enslaved biracial woman. The play itself focuses on their attempts to escape to Canada and the hardships they face during this escape as they are captured and discovered and separated from one another. The most clear themes present in this play is escape, racism, and love. The escape survives as a way to humanize African Americans in bondage by refuting harmful stereotypes present in the 1800s, such as the coon, a stupid, unreliable comic character, the tragic mulatta, a woman stained with, quote, one, one drop of Negro blood, and the Jezebel, a woman who seduces white men and bears the responsibility of their mixed child, children. Brown writes his characters as Brown writes his characters as real people because their very story is real. In the short preface to the published version of The Escape, Brown explains that the events of the play are inspired by his life, and the characters of Glenn and Melinda are actual characters that, quote, still reside in Canada. Melinda's unwanted sexual advances are reflective of Brown's mother's own experiences as a slave who was sexually assaulted by her slave master. Brown depicts Melinda as a victim of these unwanted advancements she received. Even when born free, black slaves and black Americans are not free from the cruelties of racism and how racism robs people of a normal life. <coughs> Brown's work acts as a call to action, a call for change. Even today, black Americans are still forced to challenge the stereotypes pertaining to their race labeled as uneducated and threatening, which makes it easier to ignore the plights of black communities in America. In contemporary works, the chance for a new life free from racism became something that resonated, resonated with black Americans and focused on the cause of the scale. One piece that explores this cost of escape is Rachel by Angelina Weldgren. Rachel first performed in 1916, is an anti-lynching play that focuses on the impact of racism in black families and communities. The play dwells into Rachel Loving's reaction when she learns that her family moved to the north after her father and one of her brothers were lynched. This is short-lived, however, as no matter where they go, racism follows them and strips them of a normal life. In Rachel's case, this would be motherhood as she rejects the love of her brother's friend, John Strong, and resolves to never have children who would endure the same racism that she has. Centuries later, even slavery is not yet completely removed from the lives of African Americans. While slavery federally was abolished in 1865, many states, such as California, still allow involuntary servitude, or the act of employing prisoners in order to punish them today as found in the California Constitution, Article 1, Declaration of Rights, Section 6. Now, that's quite a lot to summarize. <laughs> we have the life of a mixed playwright who wrote his experiences into his works. Then his works proceeded to humanize African Americans and influence colonial America in the 1800s. And then later on in history of black theater, we have other black playwrights also writing about escaping slavery and racism. So allow me to end this presentation on one note. Why? 
Why does any of this matter? Black theater, at its core, has always been about the experiences endured by African and Black Americans and will continue to educate those willing to listen. Reading Brown's work is necessary to understanding the purpose of Black theater, which is to educate the audience, to share these findings, and to celebrate those who have come together, like we have all come together today, to share their stories, experiences, and lives through theater. I implore everyone to take the chance to read the memoirs written by the oppressed. It's one thing to hear about how awful slavery has been to African American communities throughout history books, but it's another thing to sit down and read and read the memoir and put your shoe yourself in the shoes of a man who experienced it. Yes. Thank you. Let me, let me. This one's not yours. You're welcome. Hi, everyone. Uh, oh. <laughs> my name is Toby Akasanya. I am a rising senior at Vanderbilt University studying human and organizational development in theater. Um, thank you so much for having me today. I, like I always like to say, I'm young and very impressionable, so I have learned so much from all of you. Um, and today, as I present to you um, my submission for BTN conference and also for my senior honors thesis at Vanderbilt, um, I want you to have a conversation with me. Any reaction is, is, is necessary for my learning and for my growth. And So with that being said, today I'm going to present to you um, my paper entitled The Ever-Present Narrative, A Comparative Analysis Between Sally's Rape and Confederates. But before I dive into this place, I'll tell you a little bit about what we're going to cover today. Um, I'm going to give you an introduction to the plays. I will kind of tackle my major themes, what inspired me, and then conclude. So, the plays. Um, Sally's Rape by Robbie McCauley debuted at, in 1989, and to set it up very, very shortly, um, as Robbie McCauley, playwright and semi-protagonist, floats in and out of herself and her enslaved ancestor Sally, she uses her privileges as a theater artist to reclaim a life her ancestors disturbed but were never afforded. And though many people might consider this to be an autobiographical piece or a solo piece, if you will. She's also joined on stage by a character named Jeannie. Jeannie is a person, yes, but she is a personification of a coy white America, um, where Robbie kind of positions herself um, as a champion of that narrative. And to tell you a little bit about Confederates, Confederates debuted in 2022. It is by the amazing playwright Dominique Morso. Um, one thing that I really like about this piece is that it kind of veers from her traditional work and she even says this in her board that it's not to, she usually talks a lot about like, the American dream, industrialism, and unions and workers' rights, but in Confederate she talks about 
or she, she centers her work on Sandra, a college pro pro professor caught in the bounds of institutional racism. Um, Sandra is a woman trying to shine in the light that has historically not been cast on her. And the play goes back and forth between the plantation and a contemporary academic environment, and throughout the play, more so kind of uses this, this platform in order to say that the difference between the two isn't as stark as it is. So moving forward, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about myself. So like I said, I'm from Alabama, and for my K through 12 um, education, I was only taught by two black teachers. And I remember deciding to leave my small town in Alabama, Gadsden, if anyone knows that. But now, <laughs> yeah, it's really small. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if you didn't know that. Um, I remember deciding to leave my small town, and I realized, oh, this is not normal. It's not normal to not be, to be taught, not be taught by someone that looks like you. Mm -hmm. And I knew the minute that I got to be in that I was going to do everything in my power to make up for lost time. So one of the beautiful things about having a theater education, a formal theater education like that is you have so many resources. So I remember going to my professor and saying, I want to read plays. I want to read any play that you have me read, but I want it to be only by black women. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to hear stories that I had missed out on um, in my early childhood education. And I remember my professor, my mentor, one of the best people in my life, Dr. Crystal Tipp, she's going to be here today. She, she, she gave me Sally's Rape and Confederates, and uh, amongst many other plays. And I remember reading those, and I remember thinking, these plays are talking to each other. In my brain, I wonder, what, what about these plays makes them have conversations with each other? Um, and from there, I, I, I know there's many other beautiful black female written plays, but for some reason I knew that these were my two. Um, and I think, so here are some of the themes that I, I, were able, I was able to conjure through reading these plays. Um, I read them, I started, my, started writing this paper in January, in the month of January I probably read both plays about ten times. Just because it still was surprising me, it was still becoming new. Um, within my brain. And just to tell you a little bit about the topics that I won't be diving into um, for the duration of this presentation, we have womanism. I know it's, it's beautiful because even my fellow scholars, it's like our papers, I can see that they're in conversation with each other. I, I thank you for that very, very much. But with womanism, you, the unsung hero, the unsung cousin of feminism, um, what Alice Walker calls tending to your garden, what it means to be black and woman at the same time. It's a layered experience, the idea of double jeopardy, um, the idea of time, even in my own journey as a 21-year-old student at a college, I'm still trying to make up for lost time. And what does that look like in the, in the mind of a playwright? Um, and I, I, I also feel like even my fellow scholars, you probably had some of these themes pop up in your writing. And that's, that's again, that's, that's a testament to the power um, the black But as I move on, I want to hone in on three major topics. The first one being darkness and light. So, as I said before, I, I, um, I'm going to be talking a lot about my, my childhood experience as I give you this presentation. But one thing that is super important is that I've always been a child that is interested in art. And one thing crazy and amazing about art is that art, again, is always talking to each other. So. When I was in high school, I had a really big draw to art history, and one of the one of art history terms that I've always hold held on to as I again embarked, embarked on my journey um, in theater is the term chiaroscuro. Um, chiaroscuro is an art history term that talks about stark darkness and light existing together within a singular image, and. It's, like, it's even surprising to me now because I feel like this is the black experience. You can experience stark darkness and stark light within a singular period, moment in time. Um, in both plays, darkness represents what has been imposed on black women without their consent, 
Life being a sense of exposure, realization, and relief that comes when the past creeps into the present. Abuse is dark and empowerment is light. And both Macaulay and Morris are able to evince these feelings simultaneously within their respective pieces. And one uh, expert uh, excerpt I'm going to read to you from Confederates um, kind of explains that. So, Sandra, I've worked here for seven years. I'm tenured. I've seen lots of minds. You're one of the unforgettable ones. Malik, you've never told me that. Sandra, sometimes you have to tell a student. Sometimes you have to observe and push. I see now that I need to balance my strategy with you, but I have to push. Mm -hmm. For a number of reasons, I have to push you. I have to make sure that your work is airtight. Do you understand? Bleak. Because I'm a black man? Sandra. Because there will be many doubts about you here, about whether or not you're equipped, deserving of a scholarship, and I won't allow it to take up space. What does that mean? Like, what? How? How does a person internalize that feeling? I again am young. I am from a different generation than Sandra is from. My reaction would be to be reactionary, to react mm -hmm. and push against the curtain. But as I said before, Sandra is a college professor caught in the bounds of his institutional racism. I don't know whether or not she's right or wrong. I don't even know if that's the right answer or question to pose. But one thing to remember when you think about Sarah Sandra is that this is her trying to survive in a light that has always been shown on her white counterpart and also her colleagues. <coughs> now moving forward, um, I want to talk about the term talking back. As many of you know, Bell Hooks coined the term. Um, and it's meant to talk about the fact that black women are meant to change the direction of speech. But I want you all to imagine with me, if you will. Imagine you're on the playground, you're at your house, somewhere where you feel comfortable, and someone does something wrong to you. What do you do? My mom is here, so I'm sure she knows that I, I, I feel, I'm sorry. Um, but it's again, like this, this idea of talking back has always been reduced for black women to a domestic space. Some might argue that black women have always been talking back. I am black woman, I have always been talking back. <laughs> but what does that look like when you're not at home? When you exit the, work, the, the home, the place that you were meant to feel comfortable in? It's not as pretty, it's not as, it's not a slap on the hand. It's something way bigger and way deeper. It's slavery, it's affirmative action. It's all of these, these violent items. Um, and I, again, the, uh, Robbie McCauley explains this, explains what it means to create the space, be the clock maker. You know what I mean? Step into the position where you can talk back and there's no repercussions. When you're writing a show, it's your show, you own it. But when Robbie is telling the stories of her ancestors, she's able to set her own clock, and there's no repercussions for her um, as she's talking back. In her foreword, she states, and Sally's rape it released me to physically write it. From the personal dialogue on the dialogue between me and Dee Dee Hutchins, on the dialogues with the audiences, I found just the nerve, the boldness to speak about the charged issues of race relations can be something right there. It is an act. It is not before or after the act, Saving the words, allowing dialogue, making dialogue happen is an act, a useful act in the moment. So again, as I said, Jeannie's character, Jeannie's whiteness is central to Sally slash Robbie's storytelling because she's a passive character. Therefore, the audience members are not called to focus on her. Thus, Macaulay changes the direction of the speech. Um, and the invisible role that black women have, have usually been, been cast in. Um, and lastly, I would like to talk about the idea of collective memory and remembering. So the kinship between these two terms is found in the stories that Morso and Macaulay tell. Although the characters exist in individual worlds and are not always in the same space, 
or time, there's a connection based on their race, class, and gender. The context of characters' worlds differ, therefore their value systems differ. However, in my view, the similarities outweigh the differences. Being black and woman in the United States of America is a specific, yet individual experience. And this is again said in um, Robbie McCauley's Ford to replace Sally's rape. We share a story that is known. Well, whether people know it or not, it is, as I call it, a part of their collective memory. Personal stories are the same. My listeners also know my personal story because my personal story is all of our story. This is why, this is just my part of it. The thematic thread of my work is the connection of things that have been torn apart. This is why more so in a playwright's note calls for a merging of the past and present in consciousness. It's why Sally's rape is not a recreatable experience for another ensemble of actors to do. It invites audiences through memory to take the puzzle pieces of their life that have been broken apart and piece them together in a way that serves them. Um, and again, I wasn't able to read my entire paper, but I again invite you all to read it if you like. I want to reiterate the importance of the title, the ever-present narrative. One beautiful thing about the African aesthetic in black theater is that the past informs the present, the present is now, but something in the present is going to inform the future. And I want to challenge you all to think about what that looks like in your life and use that knowledge and that understanding as you read um, more black theater. and emanating from these scholars. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking forward to it. Now we'd like to present to them their awards. Excuse me. Can you all show me? Yes, yes. just have scholars who are going to just write books. We have visual artists who are going to prepare the way in visionary. So we're going to call on Sister uh, Iris. 
Paris. Okay. Listen, listen. Three minute break so we can set up for the year. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Congratulations, guys. Um, I went to undergrad at University of Florida. Yeah! Go yeah. <laughs> Gators! Um, I got my BFA in planning design. Um, and at this day, I graduated from Carnegie Mellon University with an MFA in planning design. Um, and I spend a lot of time like traveling and exploring, and I would prefer to do that more often, but you know. Um, and I am a planning designer for theater, dance, installations, architecture, and like other forms of visual and interactive art. And I'm really passionate about how lighting can be like a plant to community health and healing, mm -hmm. and how theater can stimulate conversation and wellness in society. Um, and in my work, I strive to build a community in this industry that's very important to me, like based on altruism, empathy, and equitable, equitable practices, um, and specifically like uplifting queer black voices. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so the the first one I'm going to share with you is um, it's really incredibly dear to my heart. Um, during my time at CMU, we had the honor to share three of Adrian Kennedy's plays in a in a performance called the Adrian Kennedy Plays. Um, it was a trilogy. It consisted of He Brought Her right Back in the Box, uh, Sun, and a movie star has to star in black and white uh, mm -hmm. in that order. Cool. So. Kennedy's work is obviously like devastating and raw, like especially this one. He brought her back in a box with my first exposure to Kennedy's uh, writing and reading it for the first time. Um, when I got the script, it just it made my heartache, and I want to share this with you. Um, the next three images are from which John? Um, if you don't know the play. Um, he Brought Her Heart Back in a Box is a haunting and poetic one-act. It's set in the racially divided American South during the 1940s, and it uh, follows a complex and tragic love story between a white boy and a black girl as they navigate the challenges of their forbidden romance. Uh, the play delves into themes of like race, identity, and the incredibly destructive legacy of the past. Um, yeah. Having three plays in one show meant that the light plot had to be very flexible and adaptive. It was also, it was a delight to light. 
Um, and the next three, uh, three slides are from Adrian Kennedy's son. And lastly, um, a movie star has to star in black and white. Um, in this play, a young black writer embarks on a voyage through her life. Uh, her parents' marriage, her brother's accident, her romance, then marriage, and its subsequent uh, collapse. Um, the voyage takes place within three movies that dominate her mind. Now Voyager, Viva Zapata, and A Place in the Sun. Her voice inhabits uh, two movie stars as she becomes a bit player in her own life. Lastly is the soul font. Um, so a synopsis, because this is a new musical that was um, kind of workshop at Carnegie Mellon. Um, so ten years after high school, Patty, Selena, Caroline, and Penelope reunite following the passing of their choir teacher. And in Cabin in the Woods, old memories and past selves are summoned. This new musical developed by MFA director Rebecca Walls and the creative, creative collaborators um, made its ac academic premiere at CNU last year. We need um, to hear. We need to hear oh, you speak up. Oh, I'm not speaking a little louder, oh, louder and a little slower. Okay, sorry. I know. I fix you really quickly when I'm presenting. Okay, I'll try this. Yeah. This is good stuff. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> you want to hear it? <laughs> okay. Um, so, in the framework of an educational setting, um, I was able to experiment uh, creating handmade acetate gobos and over 200 feet of Christmas lights, which you'll see. Um, for the gobos, I made like. It's kind of hard to tell here, but there's a mountain range, and I printed them and I layered them and put them in LEDs. And there's also a really lovely full moon. Um, that was actually like a last minute addition. We had a peg on this, but it worked really well. Um, something that was fun was the transitions to work with. Um, time passing doesn't really happen in a realistic way, um, so you got to play with a lot of like odd angles and textures and color to um, show that time is passing, but not in a way that we would understand it. Christmas slides. <laughs> <laughs> All right, she should be able to click, just click the mouse. Oh, okay. oh hello. 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 Um, I'm Kayla Bonds, even I'm a recent graduate from the University of South Florida, even in the fall I, I got accepted to UCLA, even I studied <laughs> Even today 
today I will be presenting my work that I submitted for the Judy Deering Award for the Dead Like the Game. <laughs> um, my first work was a concept design that I did for Turn It Screw. It was my final project of my scenic design class. So even you know Turn It Screw was based by a horror novel by sorry. Like, like Harry James, you've been just in my contact or something. Well, well, that loading, I just didn't just tell you about it. Um, I wanted to experience with this design, like the concept of neglect and abuse, because the two children in this play was like they were abandoned by their uncle, even they were like abandoned by him, even. In charge of what? In charge of his staff. Like they were banned by their uncle. Even we learned at the beginning of the play, they were given to their uncle. No, but they gave to ask their uncle after their parents' death. Mm -hmm. Even after that, he didn't take care of them. He neglected the responsibility of staff. Even I wanted to create the scene design that explores that. Even how I start inspiration, I would create mood boards. That's how my design process. I would make a mood board that first, like, what type of design elements I wanted. Like, you see on the left side, I wanted, like, wood, like, aged wood effects. Even on the right side, well, like, I wanted, like, different moods I want to create. Like, something spooky. Like, this is a horror story. This is, like, a spooky story. So, I wanted to create that. Hmm. Oh, first, I start with sketches. Like, I wanted to make it like a, a distorted reality. That way, when I start sketching, I wanted to reflect stuff with the staircase. Even, for I start like, the first, the top one, that, like, that, I do multiple sketches. Even then, the more refined sketch. Mm -hmm. Even the final sketch is the one right here. I realized, though, during the time as a student, I didn't have that much time to create, like, a big, fantastic idea. So I settled for this one at the end. Like something more reserved, but the neglect will be more subtle, like in the like woodworks and stuff. Stuff are not like because for I would think about it, like make it like a whole like like destroy staircase and stuff. It would, it would get crazy. So I had to restrain and make something more plausible <laughs> we can do in one semester. So. Yes. Even after that, this is my um, final rendering I made in Procreate, like over the sketch, and then you just get it to create my final rendering. Even this is the drawing room where mostly everything happened. Like this is a multiple set play. Even like this is like the main set where everything happened. Even for the drawing room, I wanted the space, it had a little bit more, little neglect because it's mostly adult space. Like the children don't belong here. So that way it looks more reserved and dark, masculine colors. Because you gotta remember, this is the uncle's house. Like this is not meant for kids. So that way I'm trying to it. Even this is the drawing, uh, like the modern gray from it. So you can see like the light, like all the dark, masculine colors, all the mood lighting, I'm trying to break with this. Yeah. This is the children's nursery. You can see how more like the, the glut and the decay will reflect this in this mm -hmm. space. That will all the children will be like everything like all the glut and breaking down. Even this is the other scenic um, units I would have for the show. Like this is the hallway unit because some um, parts of the play then like a hallway. Even here is Miles bedroom. You can hear the white models on the side. Even they were outside there. Even for this play, what I would think about all of the scenic units are the same. Like easy to like they're all the same measurement. So when I would when you were to like create it, they're all like this is the same as this, this is the same as this. Like they're all the same measurement. So they could be reproduced pretty easily. Mm -hmm. 
you can hear on my paint elevation, like you see, like the one to one ratio, they're all exactly the same thing. Like the nursery is exactly the same space as the drawing room. Everything, the only thing different is like the paint job. Like all the same. Even this is my ground plans for it. Like it was going to be like our teacher gave her a senior space. We have to um, design it. So this is the drawing room, like my ground pan and center, uh, center line sections. Even here, my elevations. Even the next play that I produced, this one will really was produced for everybody. Even for this design concept, I wanted an ex ex words, extra interpretation of a graveyard because, like, the character, like, slowly realizing they're dying, so I wanted to, like, to slowly wind up to a graveyard. And for even my director only told me I wanted nature versus man. That's it. So I have free range to design anything I want. So even for this. For this one, I really did do like regular sketching because it was hard for me to interpret this specific vision I wanted. So I did a lot of white models, like I did a lot of stuff that I kept like throwing away, kept turning, interpreting, until I ended up with this model. Even this is the final rendering. Even what would happen throughout the whole play, this section up here would be covered by the movie drop. So the audience would not know there was gray on top of it. Until the dance book cop scene, like that, like the last mm -hmm. scene, even it would drop, even the audience would feel like they were on top of a graveyard the entire time. Ooh, that's nice. Yeah, even they, even the actor could play it on it. Like it, it ended up being pretty big. Even this is my um for the dark light effect mm -hmm. that during the, the dance book cop, like they were in the city, like you know, like like pretty much would not be alive. You know, the city pretty much represents that. Even for this design, this is just my diagram, like what I showed, like seeing it designed like painter charge, like how I wanted all the stuff. Like I wanted the Pacific headstone, that Pacific headstone represented. Even I wanted like decaying concrete, like I wanted that effect, so we did like paint it out on it. Even this is the model I created for it. So you see like all the decay, even they all can like even I have parameters like this is an easy to build set too like they were made with like regular eight by the four by eights so, like all this made a series series of four by eights to create this whole big structure. Mm -hmm. Even this end up being the final design like in real life. Even you see the kabuki draw this was there for the entire show until it dropped. Mm -hmm. So the audience only see this. Even for this being my first show, I actually didn't realize how big this would be. Like in when I went in model world, I like, oh, it looks so small until I saw it and realized it would end up being huge. So see, you see the other projector photo, you see the actors. Like this element here, it was like a little um, swing set for friendship. Like that was added at last minute to represent like friendship. But you can see like how the actor could like play, run around, like one of the scenes. I want to do that have a picture of that. Oh that. But one of the scenes, like they have like the main actor could run around it, we're running all around it. Hmm. And at the end, like they're mats, so they could literally jump it into the grave, like into the hole. Like there were like mats at the bottom, like crash mats. So at the end they all would just in, jump into the grave. Okay. Even this is a dance cob scene. So like this is my black light that that line. Yeah, that's like, nice. Mm -hmm. So it's always in there. Even here is my grand plan. Like this is all <coughs> made in a black box theater. Even we just I just made it in that little niche on the side. So yeah. hmm. Even here are the different units. Because, like I said, I made it like a model set. Like we made like this part, this part, this part, this part. You get all came together at the end to make this big thing. Yeah.
but okay, I expect the work stress me the hell out. I cannot do it at all. Did it? I did oh, an undergrad once. Well, because they, I, because I, I make this joke, but it's also true. I told, I told, I told, I quit Ramos to his face. It's like this in my ministry. Because <laughs> <laughs> scenic design is a process that sometimes trains me. I was like, it's not, that, God did not give me that calling. They did not give me the vision. <laughs> To do that, I was not called to do that. Well, it's funny because it was. Uh, I can give you some uh, research for He was there when I was leaving. That's his only on the set. So, like, I'm not surprised. Because I didn't have any. I didn't have any. I didn't have me. Ella? I didn't have a designer. For nothing. That's why I was like, I had to. Am I for costume story? No. Excuse me. Wow. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Ella Brooks. I'm a costume designer. Um, I got my um, undergraduate degree 10 ish years ago at North Carolina State University. Uh, I'm currently at the University of Florida. Getting my <laughs> so, um, these are the pieces that I presented for the scholarship committee. Um, they are both dance pieces, the Still Here, uh, choreographed by Trent Williams, and uh, Corazon Quintano by Issa, Ray Gar Issa Garcia Rose. Um, so, okay. Um, so, like I mentioned, um, we're going to start here with Still Here. Um, the costumes are by me, lighting design by Leo Marina, and senior design by Kate McCanna. Um, about the choreography for this piece. It was a contemporary dance piece um, that was exploring the intersection be between religious and secular music. Um, the goal was to explore the nature of creating your own church and gathering people around you to create that feeling and space of church. Um, it was also a piece in a larger dance piece called Act D that gets performed every year. Um, and that um, dance collection is an African dance collective um, mm -hmm. and music um, that are just being shown and celebrated. Um, so my inspiration for this piece was a mixture of earth tones um, and white with African prints. Um, it was a pool purchase show, so everything had to either come from the closet at the school or um, be bought. Um, I saw earlier a few people are familiar with down here, so they were got a lot of stuff from them um, as a brand. Um, so these are my sketches, um, my final sketches uh, for this piece. Um, one of the things the choreographer and I discussed was that everyone was going to have distinctive looks. Um, this is also my first time using a tablet and this app to uh, draw and design with. Uh, these. Even now, there's definitely I look at the sketches and see things that I would change now that I've worked with this medium more. Um, but when I submitted it, I thought it was important to show where I started with this medium. Uh, since everything I'd done previously was with watercolor and pen and paper, so uh, I spent the last year trying to work on digital mediums. Um, so this is the final color scheme. Um, I don't know if anybody else is trying to look for this, but finding specific colors with African prints is uh, kind of challenging uh, with pre-made garments um, to get things that don't have red, orange, and yellow in them, which was very specific. I wanted to cut those colors out of this design. Um, so finding and sourcing those things was a challenge. Uh, did I just lost my track? OK. Um, so here are some of the stage photographs. Um, there is lots of rolling on the floor in this piece, laying on top of each other, um, lots of lifts, so, um, and leg extensions, so making sure that all the costumes moved with the body and not got in the way was a big portion of this. Um, and then I also had this fun handstand element that was thrown at me, literally they changed the whole process and it was like two weeks before we went on stage, and one of the girls came to me and was like, hey, so you know how I was wearing a skirt? I'm going upside down now. And I was like, uh, yeah, we got to change that. We can't. <laughs> we can't be doing all that. I was like, I planned for maybe some leg extensions, you know, but upside down in a skirt's not a cute look for anybody. Um, so that got changed out. She is not pictured in this, but um, 
uh, for also things like making pant lengths shorter, since everyone danced barefoot, making sure that they um, didn't step on things and hems and tore things out. That was another adaptation that you have to make with clothing for dance. Uh, this is just another photo of the dancers. It's not the best photo of them, but you know, you can see the outfits. So, um, <laughs> same with this one. It's just another image so you can see the looks. And um, coincidentally, this is the only photo I got of the full cast. Um, that's not them on the floor. Um, but next, we're going to go up to Corazon Gitano. Um, so this piece was choreographed, like I said before, by Isa Garcia Rose. Um, I did the costume design, lighting was Morgan Lesson, and scenic by Jaslyn Rivero. Um, so this choreography uh, was a fusion of ballet and flamenco. Um, Isa did a trip, research trip, um, to study flamenco dance uh, the previous summer, so she came back with all sorts of ideas um, and imagery that she wanted to use with her choreography. Um, this, and then you, she wanted to use all props. Um, so we had stools and scarves and castanets. Um, and the kicking off point for me was to figure out what flamenco attire um, was mm -hmm. and what was important in concept for that. Um, so the scarves, the monton, and how to tie them was really important, as well as um, the different dress types. Um, there's like a classic flounce dress that everybody knows with all the ruffles. Um, and then a traditional canastanero and, and semi canastanero type of dress, um, just to name a few of the different types. Um, so I had to figure out how to fuse those elements with ballet and to make ballet movements um, mm -hmm. work together. Mm -hmm. um, so it also seems like a good point to uh, mention that I did work with a professional ballet company for five years. So I did have an element of what you needed to have an idea of how to work with ballet dancers. Um, I was just a work trip supervisor and I designed a couple pieces while I was there. Um, but it gave me a good kicking off point to figure out how to adapt this into something that would work for that. Um, so these are my final sketches for this piece. Um, I did these in pencil and then I went and colored them in digitally. Um, again, this is a little bit after the Attic the Didi piece, the still here, so I, they've gotten even better. Um, and the design that we ended up with was a skin tone skirt and leotard that would appear nude while standing and then show red with movement. Um, <coughs> so the leotards, I actually found a company in the US that makes custom leotards and had a wide variety of skin tones, which was the most important prerequisite for me. Um, I ended up using seven different skin tone fabrics um, between the 12 dancers. Um, to achieve the look that you'll see a little bit further on. Um, and then the skirts were built in house. Uh, this skirt at the sketch represents movement one. Um, there were three movements for this piece. Movement two, they added the scarves as a dancing accessory. And then movement three, they tied the scarves around themselves, um, which you will see again in coming up photos. Um, for this one, since we had an involved fitting process, I thought I'd include it. Um, for fittings, round one, we fit them in one of three skirts to figure out which was closest to their size, and then um, gave them the opportunity also to test out the weight of the asymmetrical hem. Um, that was super important for this because uh, it, it makes it very <coughs> difficult in one direction or the other, um, so that they knew that all the way at the beginning of the process was important so they could plan for that while they were dancing on stage. Um, so for fittings round two, um, we tried them in their own base skirt but without the ruffles so we can make sure we can do the alterations easily. Um, and then we put the ruffles on later. This also was the first time that we got to see all of the pieces together. Um, this also feels like a good moment to mention that um, this is one of those times where asking questions uh, can be rewarding. Um, I emailed the company that was making the leotards and was like, hey, uh, can I buy fabric from you guys? Because I need to make all these skirts that match the leotards perfectly. And at first they were like, yeah. And then they found out how much I needed and they were like, mm, no. But I will tell you where we buy it. And so they gave me all of their suppliers for their fabric except for the one that they dyed themselves in house. So for that one I found a close enough fabric and we dyed it. Um, but it was definitely helpful when you're trying to order anybody who knows 
about wearing nude mm -hmm. fabrics. They all have random names. They all are not the same, even though you'll see 16 different colors of tan. Um, <laughs> So it was vastly helpful that they were willing to share that information with me. Um, so this is um, from the first movement. Um, it's also the closest that I get to having a uh, photo of everybody standing still so you don't have to see the red element. Um, and then this one gives you more of a visual of everybody twirling. Um, the skirts each also had six stacked layers of circle ruffles. Um, if anybody has any sewing experience, circle ruffles can be kind of like, you know, this size-ish, depending on the width you're doing, and um, they ended up with cutting like 450-ish circles mm -hmm. to get all 12 girls' uh, ruffles together for this these costumes. They all hated me in the costume shop for a, a little while. Um, <laughs> So this is the second movement. This is where we add the scarves for dancing with, but they're not wearing them yet. Um, this is also Gabby. Um, I showed a picture of her earlier, um, but fun fact, she was not supposed to be in this piece. Um, she actually walked by the rehearsal space, heard the music, and was like, hey, I do flamenco dance, and I also sing it. Um, and the choreographer was like, she's got to be in. Um, so later on in the process, I actually ended up having to source a dress for her. Um, she did come to us with all of her dress options that she had, but none of them like suited the visual I was going for. Um, so I actually had to find a company to make one and send it to us really quickly. Um, Uh, so, um, she also danced with castanets, and this is also a point where she uh, bought some time for the dancers to be changing and adding the scarves on, um, so that way there's just like seamless transitions between the three movements. Um, and then this is the third movement, um, and this we have the dancers wearing the scarves in three different traditional styles of tying them. Um, and they all got a different one based off of what they thought they were capable of doing in the time that they had. Some of them, you know, got just tied around their hip um, because that's all they thought they could handle, and I was okay with that. Um, and others got more complicated, uh, more traditional styles of tying. Um, and this is one of the final photos, but anybody have any questions? <laughs> context of this award. Judy Deering was a phenomenal designer, uh, most noted for some of her productions. She received an OB for Charles Fuller's A Soldier's Play, well renowned for Izaki's for Color Girls. Right. Excuse me, I get a little nervous and emotional for more than one reason right now, and I'll stop. You all give me joy. I am the first <coughs> recipient of the Judy Deering Award. Yes. It is my honor and my privilege to share this space with you, so thank you. Yeah. So I just want to let you all know that context. I met Judy Deering in August of 95 when I went to my first BTA conference. I met with Peter Wells from FAMU, Valencia Matthews. <laughs> I'm not going to be there. Judy Derry from Howard, Dr. Janina Stewart from Alabama State, and they all offered me a job on my first conference. Well, I said no <laughs> to all of them. Begrudgingly, they have held me to that for my entire career. <laughs> but I was fortunate. And proud of the fact that I said, I need to work. I need to see what's going on in the field in order to impact the field. Yeah. I could not do this comfortably if I didn't know what it was like to work in the field. Mm -hmm. So fade in, fade out. I just want to make sure you all understand where the work comes from and how it originated because it came after 
for passing in that fall after our lunch date in August. And I applied and received the award. So once again, congratulations, and we are so very proud to include you in our family. Welcome.